pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. That was a song by Lady Day, Billie Holiday. It's called Strange Fruit, and I actually want to begin with a quick story about it. I encourage everybody to take a few minutes and watch the video and listen to this song, either before or after this lecture. So this song uh, was not written by Billie Holiday, but she began to perform it just after the turn of the 20th century, and she gained access to many of the nightclubs and dance halls in the South, where before only white folks had been allowed to perform. And when she began to sing this song and a few others like it on stage, Stage, uh, she got some uh, pushback for it, and in specific, the head of the Bureau of Narcotics contacted her and ordered her to stop singing this song. Uh, obviously, Billie Holiday refused, and what followed was almost a decade of direct attacks against Billie Holiday by the Bureau of Narcotics, and eventually their attacks led to her death. She ended up in a hospital room, chained to a hospital bed, her methadone with withdrawn by the government, ordered to be taken away, as she slowly detoxed and died from pancreatic or liver cancer. Uh, Billie Holiday is a great example of where this story really starts, because not only is she related to the images that are being projected to the public, that quite often the powers that be do not want projected to the public, but also of uh, active resistance and refusing to, to let down. I want to take us back and sort of weave this week's reading into some of the ideas and themes we've already encountered, specifically Plato's cave. Now, if you remember, Plato had sort of been a jerk and said that anybody who fancies themselves an artist is an ass. He had essentially said that when an artist represents something, they will, are never good enough to do it justice. It will never be, a building will never be painted to the exact specifications that the engineer make sure that it is built to. And because of this, when we see an artistic representation, whether that's a picture or a poem or a movie or anything that we would call art, uh, it is a misrepresentation and we automatically are misled by it. Now, sometimes this misleading is as simple as thinking, oh, I thought that building was taller or shorter than it is. Other times this misleading uh, can really be dangerous. It can really lead us astray of what happens simply by seeing an image. And we've talked about this a lot earlier in the semester already. So with Plato's cave, the allegory goes that the artist, the person who is holding the dove on a stick and sort of projecting a puppet show on the wall that the man sitting on the other side is pointing to, is in charge of what this other guy sees. And all of the guy that's sitting there pointing can see, all that he can take in and understand is his perspective. He can't understand that there is a person back there projecting this to them. He can't understand there is a light and that this is how shadows work. He can't understand that it's not even a real dove. His perspective is restricted to what he can see. And this sort of does ring true for all of us. So to tie this into the readings this week, long and short of it is that uh, Harold and DeLuca were suggesting that prior to this, lynching and uh, public violence against black folks had gone underground. It at one point was public, and we would have public square lynchings where the town would turn out to show their support, but it had begun to disappear, but it wasn't uh, gone, it simply wasn't public. And so as a black person in America, for years, you had to live in a world where you kind of knew that violence was a thing that white supremacy would inflict on your body, but you maybe didn't see it all the time. But you still felt like you had to perform a certain role just to prevent the, the dangerous monster that you weren't really sure what it would look like. Now, what Harold and DeLuca are suggesting is that when Emmett Till's picture circulated, the image informed that perspective and everything changed. From then on out, it was no longer a maybe violence will be inflicted, maybe it will be vocal, maybe it will be physical. Physical. Maybe it will be one person, maybe it will be a group. From that point on out, there was a very real image and a body and a story that informed black folks' way of being in, in the United States. That's the point that DeLuca and Harold are really making here. So I want to tie this into a bigger theme that is sort of central to a lot of my work, chronic wokeness. This idea that as humans, for as far back as we can look, we all have this tendency to want to have done the work that we need to do and to uh, be good people, to be woke, right? And we either, to, to accomplish this, can do the work and change things that are around us, or we can simply decide that we have done the work and we can pick some things that look like they've been changed. As an example of this, 
I've noticed recently on television that you'll see the NFL last year and uh, some various other sports have begun to brag that they finally have their first woman as a referee. And we all watch that on television. And if you've heard it, we tend to be tempted to feel good about it, to, to pat ourselves on the back and to say, you know, we're making some progress. And in so doing, we sort of uh, dust our hands off and fancy ourselves woke. We feel like we've actually done some of the work that needs to be done, ignoring the fact that only having one woman as a referee out of X amount of referees historically is a terrible thing. It's not a good thing. But we deliberately spin it the opposite way as a culture because it makes us feel much better to say good for us and to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, so take this thinking to lynching photos that we've all seen on Google and think of the crowds in these photos and the way that you will see people who seem uh, like they're celebrating and you will see other people who seem very stern and uh, very serious faced as if they're doing their civic duty. But what you will never see in these photos is anybody hiding their face. And the reason for that is uh, there was no shame here. This was an event that people felt like they were reveling in the nastiness that it was to be a human being so you could torture and maim. Not at at all. These were folks that actually, by and large, thought that they were doing their civic duty and they figured out a way to construct it in a way so that they, they were actually being moral and ethical compared to the people that came before them who kept uh, plantations and did whatever they wanted without any oversight. We were at least getting together in a public square. We look back on this from our point in history and we think this is disgusting. But at the time, this is what people managed to convince themselves of as a group. And if you fast forward this, you can realize that we are actually still doing this today. We all walk through the world daily. Our lives are okay. We don't often think about the fate of our criminal justice system, all the while one in three black men in our country will spend time in prison compared to just one in 18 white men. So these systems are still at work. They've just sort of morphed and changed in a way that allows all of us that participate to point to the past and say, well, we're not as bad as they used to be. It is also worth thinking about some of the dialectical tensions that were built into the article this week. The North versus the South, I've noticed that in the United States, this is often a way of talking about social justice, civil rights, the, the Civil War, and uh, suggesting that there was a bunch of bad guys down in the South and a bunch of good guys up North. It turns out that this dialectical tension is mostly hogwash. The same racist attitudes and beliefs and behaviors that existed in the South have always and continue to exist in the North. I grew up in Michigan and there were Confederate flags everywhere. I don't know why they thought they were from the South, but Clearly, that flag means more than just Southern heritage. Uh, same thing with white supremacy. You can think of this dialectical tension of visibility and invisibility and how with Emmett Till, there was a, this very real movement to, between the two. The sinking of the body and the weighing it down was meant to keep invisible the power at work and yet him becoming visible, invisible rather, disappearing, poof, was also publicly spread. Uh, people knew what had happened. So it wasn't as much of a secret, but it was simply a way to let power be visible and invisible at the same time. And that's another way to think about dialectical tensions. And we'll come back to these repeatedly also throughout the semester. So in short, and I put the quote in front of you, this is where I would focus if you're really trying to figure out what are DeLuca and Harold saying here? I understand this is a very deep and uh, troubling article and it, it's difficult to read this stuff. However, these articles may be some of the most important we will cover throughout the course of this semester and throughout the course of your education career.